Gen Z has been subject to a lot of trauma, a lot of collective trauma. In this video, I hope to speak to that. I hope to explain what collective trauma is. I wanna talk about how our responses to it lead to the social ills we often talk about, toxicity, all that. And I wanna give you, the viewers, some hope and some insight on how we can all heal trauma in ourselves. First thing though, I wanna say that a common response that you're gonna get when you talk about the trauma that Gen Z deals with is talk about Gen Z being soft. You know, you guys are too soft, you guys aren't traumatized, your struggles pale in comparison to the struggles of previous generations. Gen Z just needs to get tougher, tougher. This is the kind of response that you see, for instance, in response to content like this. A video of a young person having an emotional breakdown while discussing the stresses they experience working as a barista. People wonder why we need a union at Starbucks and I am literally about to quit. I like I get I'm like a full time student. I get scheduled for 25 hours a week, and then on weekends they schedule me the entire day open to close. I'm on the schedule for eight and a half hours, both Saturday and Sunday. I'm like three and a half hours into my shift. There's so many customers, and we have four people on the floor all day. We don't have fair scheduling. Managers don't care about us. Our manager was supposed to come in this weekend, and he took himself off the schedule, so he wouldn't be able to be held accountable for calling out. He just literally tore down the schedule that he was scheduled on and put up a new schedule where he wasn't on the schedule. Also, he couldn't have even seen that he was scheduled in the first place because he didn't want to be held accountable for not wanting to come in. <laughs> they don't want to help us. Comments like, welcome to life, princess, and it's disgusting and pathetic are some of the most palatable that I could find. Look, I could easily rant angrily about how these apparent older folks are just giving a young person a hard time for no real reason. I could point out, like others have, that logically most people would have similarly frustrated reactions to doing service work like this given the amount of energy and labor that it takes with very little compensation as a result. I've worked service before. It's not fun. But the main thing I wanna say is that we all deal with trauma and stress and anger and we all deal with it in different ways. Some of us try to be open about our emotional struggles and some of us will often take it out on people that we feel are lesser than us in some way. And usually we dabble in both. But especially when I see the dynamic of older people essentially bullying younger people for not being tough enough, I just remember that a lot of the time folks are trying to call attention to their own suffering or to the suffering of others, which they feel has been neglected so long that they can't help but demean people to try to bring attention and sympathy to it. Here's the thing, trauma does not have to be the most violent or the most oppressive thing. Trauma can be valid even if it seems minor in the grand scheme of things. Bessel van der Kolk has a book, The Body Keeps the Score. I'm gonna be talking about it a bit in this video. And at the beginning of the book, he writes, one does not have to be a combat soldier or visit a refugee camp in Syria or the Congo to encounter trauma. Trauma is not a diagnosis. Trauma is not a pathology. Trauma is when your body, mind, or emotional state endures significant stress. That's it, that's all. Every single person alive has traumatic experiences. If we want to get a little nitty gritty, there's little t trauma, meaning, yeah, it's bad, but most people are able to get over this just fine, and big t trauma, which is a before and an after. So from here, I'm gonna start talking about traumas. I'm gonna talk about collective and occasionally personal traumas that seem to make up a lot of what the Gen Z experience is. I'm gonna to try to analyze the effects of these traumas. Lastly, before I get further into this video, I just wanna say that I have monetized it. Um, YouTube is beginning to be a career for me, hopefully, and I'm putting a lot of labor into this and a lot of work. I could use some funding. So if you have ad blocker on, that's fine, I don't mind, but if you have it off, there'll be three ad breaks in this video, the first of which is coming right now. Within a three day span, we have received news of the violent death of an iconic rap artist in takeoff of the Migos, which is something that I'm having a lot of trouble understanding right now. The tragic death of the three year old son of Nigerian Afrobeats artist DeVito and a massive stampede causing over 100 deaths during a Halloween event in Itaewon, South Korea. And these all stand out as terrifying and horrible 
current events in a year and in a collection of years that have been filled with news cycles focused on catastrophic war events in Ukraine and wars potentially happening between Western and Eastern powers, the avalanching effects of climate change, a debilitating global pandemic, and so much more. A lot of times young people, sometimes Gen Z, sometimes millennials, sometimes cuspers like me, are compelled to go online and expose themselves to these things. There's almost a sense of duty or a desperate need to socialize as well in a time where mental illness and atomization and financial struggle seem more normalized in a human life than the act of physically being there for somebody. And I think that this is where culture wars come from. There's a desperate need for young people to deal with how overwhelmed they are by this constant sense of grief and confusion and anger. And a lot of times the content on social media will offer simplified ideas that we can try to pin our feelings to. We're always in a position of playing defense, always trying to be ontologically on the right side. Are we on the right side? Are we on the good side? Are we connecting to the right ideas? And we do so when we're creating content, we do so when we're consuming content. And we're usually doing one of the two. Make no mistake, this is a nightmare. Gen Z reality is a nightmare that only seems pleasant because the only resource that we all seem to have in excess is a wealth of tools and resources that we could use to try to make ourselves look well adjusted and look like we're dealing with things, but we're not dealing with things. And we don't even know what it is like to deal with things. We know what it's like to look like we're doing well and to look like we know what we're doing and we know what the solutions are to these constant overarching problems, but we just know what it looks like. We don't know what it actually feels like to heal. Because of this, it's easy to mock things like trauma talk and the many dramatic renditions of traumatic events alongside the self-diagnoses and mental health tips that are often poorly advised. But these are all ultimately ways that people like you and me, younger and older, are trying to reclaim agency in a world where nobody feels like they have any. So when you don't feel like you have any agency, then yeah, you're going to cling to ideas. You're going to cling to statuses, identities, and you're going to cling to things that you can create and consume and associate with. Because what else are you going to do? You have no say. You have no power over these horrible things that you're constantly subjected to. So these are the things that seem to make up the Gen Z experience. But is it trauma? How do we know that it's trauma exactly? Well, let's talk about collective trauma. So, I'm using this term collective trauma, how do I define that? Well, according to the National Library of Medicine, the term collective trauma refers to the psychological reactions to a traumatic event that affects an entire society. It does not merely reflect an historical fact, the recollection of a terrible event that happened to a group of people. It suggests that the tragedy is represented in the collective memory of the group. And like all forms of memory, it comprises not only a reproduction of the events, but also an ongoing reconstruction of the trauma in an attempt to make sense of it. There's a 2008 study that I'm going to talk about briefly that talks about a particularly well-known case of collective trauma. It's called 9-11. I'm sure you've heard of it. Please don't make me describe it. In this study from 2008, the researchers know how Americans, having witnessed the attacks, constituted both a collective cultural upheaval for the American people at large and a directly experienced individual trauma for a small proportion of Americans. The study also focused on one notable outcome of the trauma, which is how people who received this trauma found themselves searching for meaning in life and searching for meaning from those events. Most respondents were searching for meaning in the terrorist attacks but remained unable to find any adequate way to understand the events. And this is something that happens with traumas. We try to find meaning. We try to figure them out. At the start of the last section, I mentioned some collective traumas or candidates for collective trauma that many Gen Z folks and Gen Z adjacent folks, let's say, have experienced just in this past week. I'm, I'm doing this on November 2nd. Now, this is often a uniquely Gen Z experience because Gen Z is the most correlated with social media, often the most use, using of social media. That's the that's the word I'll go with. Now, I'm talking about Gen Z specifically because even though we are all using social media, Gen Z tends to be the most online, the most on social media, and the generation that has been raised by the internet and social media even the most directly. I'm a cusper and I can attest to how life changed when social media came in. 
I'm 26, I can attest to the experience of constantly seeing, for instance, scandals that are filled with traumatizing details about important iconic artists and scandals in politics and extremely devastating world events that took many lives and seeing the details of those things and seeing the videos that are spread on Twitter oftentimes showing gruesome things, absorbing all these things on a regular basis and then absorbing discourse about it. And then when I finally put my phone down, I look my parents or older folks that aren't my parents in the face and it's like we're in different worlds. It's like they must be looking at me as if my eyes are sunken. Like they must look at me as if I am covered in cobwebs because I just feel almost dead inside. Like I just feel dark and broken, you know? Now we're using the word trauma a lot and to clarify, the APA defines trauma as an emotional response to a terrible event like an accident, crime, or natural disaster. Look at how my definitions are working backwards here. First we define a type of trauma, then we define trauma. It's great, we're doing great. Um, <laughs> Van der Kolk writes in The Body Keeps the Score that long after a traumatic experience is over, it may be reactivated at the slightest hint of danger and mobilize disturbed brain circuits and secrete massive amounts of stress hormones. This precipitates unpleasant emotional emotions, intense physical sensations, and impulsive and aggressive actions. These post-traumatic reactions feel incomprehensible and overwhelming. Feeling out of control, survivors of trauma often begin to fear that they are damaged to the core and beyond redemption. And these are the kinds of things that we absorb and experience, oftentimes in, in micro ways, right? But through social media, through this collective trauma. And that's not just through like one event being terrible, but I also think it has to do with the collection, the aggregation of event after event after event that becomes soul sucking, that creates a larger experiential sense of collective trauma. And it's no coincidence that trauma is such an interesting subject on social media right now, that mental health is such a widely discussed subject on social media. Look, I know it's easy to bash TikTokers. I know that there's a lot of things that you can criticize about trauma talk, but at least one of the things that gets well among others, is that it reflects how different people process trauma in different ways and allows people to engage with their trauma and to think about traumas that they've suppressed so much that they didn't even realize they were there. This is one of numerous ways we can recognize trauma in our culture, that is, through expression. So let's talk about expression a bit. I have subsections for this section, the first is called repression and humor. So first, repression, emotional repression to be specific. One of the ways in which trauma becomes a lasting thing in a person's life is through constant emotional repression, which can be defined as the general term that is used to describe the tendency to inhibit the experience and the expression of negative feelings or unpleasant cognitions in order to prevent one's positive self-image from being threatened. I was doing research for this video and one of the things I found fascinating was a clip of the writer and physician Gabor Mate talking about Jordan Peterson. And he talks about how Jordan Peterson makes certain points that are really good for self-help purposes and that probably contributes to his fame in terms of how he's helped a lot of people. But he also seems to have this difficult time when it comes to expression of emotions. It's like he's both trying to liberate one from the, the difficulties of emotional repression, but it's like he's encouraging people to emotionally repress. When I read him, I sense a lot of suppressed rage in him. I, I, in fact, I think his voice is choking with rage a lot of the time. It's interesting because he talks about rage, that you have to deal with it. I don't think he understands just how angry he is. And, it's, and, and, and if you look at his websites, the comments are full of rage by his young acolytes. In his book, he talks about how an angry two-year-old child needs to be sit by themselves until they get over it rather than understanding why a child would be angry at age two, what frustrations they're having, and what human contact they need to help them move through that anger, he says repress the anger. So he's all about repressed anger as far as I'm concerned. And it's very interesting how he talks about children. He talks about little varmints and little monsters and so on. I know that's meant to be humorous, but it's also a certain way of thinking of the young human child. So fundamentally, I see him as an agent of repression. He posing as an agent of libertarianism. Emotional repression is obviously a type of harmful coping mechanism that many seek to alleviate with other coping mechanisms. So, you know, coping mechanism on top of coping mechanism, and of course that's where we get humor. We define Gen Z oftentimes by the memes, by the jokes, by the constant 
barrage of ironic, usually dark humor. I mean, that's what I see anyway, just dark humor on top of dark humor all over Twitter and Instagram and TikTok. And humor can be a helpful type of coping mechanism and it can help you deal with stress and anxiety, but it's not necessarily always the best thing, especially when you think of it as a direct way to deal with the problem and not just an easing of the problem. But there's also just ways in which humor can be harmful in and of itself. There's a Psych Central article that posits that there are negative forms of humor that can be self-defeating and harmful to others. For instance, the popularity of jokes that you make at your own expense or that you make at the expense of others. Those are worrying, right? I mean, jokes can be jokes and jokes can be funny and everybody's got different contexts and different receptions of different jokes. But at a certain point, you have to wonder why there is so much of an emphasis on jokes that self-deprecate or that insult other people. So firmly attached and so firmly interwoven into all types of these social media discourses. And I won't get into postmodern scholarship, but there's definitely something to be said about how ironic detachment plays a role in all of this. How ironic detachment has become a color through which so many things are filtered as if there's something that we're hiding or something that we're trying to understand or that we just refuse to understand and so we're constantly speaking with irony around these things you know anyway (laughs) the point is that coping mechanisms do little to actually change situations they more so just allow us to manage the feelings and the thoughts that we have which we often see as unpleasant and wants to chase away similar to how substance abuse can be a type of coping mechanism right but substance abuse is obviously not good and sometimes things like humor or the conventional ways we express ourselves on social media can be not good for us too Content consumption can be not good for us too. And moreover, it's less about it being good or bad than it is about it being not a true solution, you know? So this next subsection is hypervigilance and toxicity. So hypervigilance is also a form of expression that I argue has a particular color in what we may see as toxic online discourse. Another Psych Central article. This one defines hypervigilance simply as a biological adaptation to stress. It's your brain's method of trying to keep you out of harm's way by being highly alert and aware of your surroundings. So in a traditional sense, hypervigilance is like when you're in a relationship and you're constantly checking up on a partner because you're afraid that they're going to cheat on you. And so you might be looking through their texts or you might be following them or you might be getting extra demanding about them coming home at certain times. This is a type of hypervigilance. You're doing way too much trying to correct a potential issue or avoid a potential issue. And a lot of the time, it's a response to trauma that you've experienced in the past because you've been in relationships that you've been cheated on or you've seen a lot of infidelity around you. Now, when it comes to toxicity, I think a lot of the toxic behavior that we blame as being cancel culture or puritanical is a form of hypervigilance that happens with young people. A lot of the time, these people are from marginalized backgrounds or have had difficult upbringings in some sort of way. They've had some sort of traumatic situation in their upbringing, and they've seen these different abusive or oppressive acts either in their personal lives or in the culture around them and the constant barrage of social media, and they're trying to be extra aggressive in combating it. They're trying really hard to be aware of it at all times, wherever it might be, even if it's not there. And yes, that can be bad. Like it can get too far. One of the ways that it can get too far is that there's this emphasis on this ontological goodness, on people being pure, on people being good at all times, in all ways, by definition. Are you a good fan? Are you a good leftist? Are you a good LGBTQ person? Are you a good LGBTQ plus ally? Did you forget the plus? What's going on? If you're not meeting that standard of ontological goodness, you're probably gonna receive some toxicity from folks that if they see you will potentially call you out in ways that are oftentimes over the top or unfair. And a lot of the times that that happens with folks that have been traumatized by bad behaviors around them in their own lives or traumatized by a landscape in which they're constantly under this surveillance. And so what happens when you're under surveillance and people are scrutinizing you all the time? You pick up that behavior too in part because you're trying to preserve yourself by pointing out that other people are below the standard that you set. It's this vicious cycle that comes as a result of our livelihoods being spectacularized. Here's my next subsection, spectacle and media. 
Care for some theory? The theorist Guy Debord starts his seminal book, The Society of the Spectacle, with a definition. In societies where modern conditions of production prevail, life is presented as an immense accumulation of spectacles. Everything that was directly lived is now merely represented in the distance. Why does this happen? It happens as a result of labor alienation. People are alienated from the work that they do, the products they create, merely receiving a wage in exchange for producing it for the capitalist class. Oh, he said the C word, he said capitalist. Here we are. The more that this alienation occurs and spreads into all different forms of a person's life, the more alienated the person becomes from life. The spectacle's social function is the concrete manufacture of alienation. The spectacle is capital accumulated to the point that it becomes images. Gen Z is a generation growing up after centuries of labor alienation, of labor exploitation. They've been raised decades after the rise of neoliberalism, which seeks to envelop everything that arises from people into some sort of commoditized, capitalized form. This occurs, for instance, in movements like the punk rock movement that starts in grassroots DIY spaces, oftentimes with leftist, anarchist political thoughts and then turns into a t-shirt you can get at the mall and a hairdo. Things that you can only acquire properly with capital. Eating is no longer eating. In order to eat, you have to first have money, which has to come from some sort of bank account, which has to have been received as a wage in exchange for labor that's been alienated from you. Then you've gotta exchange that money in that bank account, oftentimes through a device that is created by a corporation. The bank account, by the way, corporate. And you take it to a place that is either a corporation that makes food with food stores, or you go to a independent food store or some other type of food store that relies on corporations to stay alive, like the corporations that run the city around it or the corporations that may produce the machines that they use or may get the produce that they use. There are so many layers <laughs> of labor alienation, of alienation, of capitalism stacked into everything that we do. Hand gesture. And these are all spectacle. They're all things that we think are just part of eating, but they're not. They're things that we have associated as being necessary to life, but they're not necessary to life. They are created and they are forced upon us. Not that I don't use Seamless, because I do use Seamless, okay? I like to order food. But let's be real here. It's no wonder that Gen Z is so media obsessed, both in terms of creation and consumption. It's easy to call kids facetious and shallow for making TikToks, but what are they supposed to do? The only way to be something is to perform for the spectacle. At least when you make content online and you post it and you potentially get viral, like there's at least some level to which you're closer to the labor because you have a control to some degree over the content itself. If you're trying to be a doctor, for instance, think of how much you have to perform. You have to perform the role of a student, perform the role of a graduate, perform the role of a doctor through all these different chambers with all these different representations you have to offer. You have to constantly represent yourself as being the thing that the machine wants you to be. I don't wanna get into this machine thing. I'm just saying, this is what the spectacle is, according to DeBoer. The time that you spend not being something by doing representations until you either become it or you decide that you aren't going to become it because your representations don't meet the standard you've set for your representations. If you don't do that, then you're consuming representations, okay? You're either consuming representations or you're embodying them. Obsession with media is not just a Gen Z fixation. It's a necessity of life at this point. Even for those who are not online very much, it has seeped into every part of our life. Debor used the term representation in his book, which often works as a strong critique of how our political and social ideologies work. He says, stars, spectacular representations of living human beings, project this general banality into images of possible roles. As specialists of apparent life, stars serve as superficial objects that people can identify with in order to compensate for the fragmented productive specializations that they actually live. The function of these celebrities is to act out various lifestyles or socio-political viewpoints in a full, totally free manner. They embody the inaccessible results of social labor by dramatizing the byproducts of that labor, which are magically projected above it as its ultimate goals. Power and vacations, the decision-making and consumption that are at the beginning and the end of the process that is never questioned. I don't know, I just find the representation stuff fascinating because of how it correlates with the representation discourses we have now. Representation in media, representation in politics. 
We're very fixated as a society in representing race, representing ethnicity and gender and sexuality in our media and in the things that we see represented. We want to enhance that representation. But is this really a strong correlation with our lived experience, which is kind of what politics is supposed to be, right? Like you're supposed to be negotiating on behalf of your interests, but instead we're negotiating on behalf of being represented better. Like I'm Dominican and if I'm Dominican and the majority of my political and social ideology is to try to make Dominican people represented better on TV and in social media and that's my ideation for how to enhance us politically in some way. Is that really attached with the lived experience of most Dominican people? Is that really going to do much? I mean, it can do something. It's not to say that you shouldn't participate in representation at all. I have my issues with people that act like they're so above it. But at the same time, we have to acknowledge like what, what happened to eating, right? Like what happened to negotiating material things, to, to gaining material power? We're fully accepting the spectacle as the most important part of our lives. And I mention all of this because it's a huge part of Gen Z's traumatization. Often the representations that we are taking in are traumatizing representations. And the only ways that we know how to deal with them are through representations. And this is a spiral of what is essentially coping mechanisms and talking at and around things rather than addressing issues at their core. And it's no wonder why we have so many issues addressing our personal traumas and collective traumas at their core. We'll watch a million TikToks about how to break down trauma, but do we sit in silence and contemplate and take that advice and do it? It's a whole different ball game. Well, let's do it. Let's do an ad break. Let's get into the conclusion. So let's heal trauma. Let's heal our trauma. In order for Gen Z to fix many of its cultural issues, it has to heal its traumas and work to prevent traumas from occurring which of course is to a degree an impossible task, but a lot of the traumas that happen in our lives are preventable ones. And that, that part is a matter of political discussion that I'm not gonna delve further into. I wanna focus on healing because a lot of y'all don't think healing is possible. And I'm here to tell you it's not only possible, it's necessary and you need to get on it. The first step is that you, you have to recognize that healing requires lived experience, requires deeply in touch lived experience rather than engaging merely with representations of it. The representations can only help you so much. You have to live in your life with a desire to heal your life, with a desire to heal your brain. Self-care is something that's been made shallow in media a lot of the times. Like I love a good skincare regimen and a good massage, but come on, like there's more to it than that. Self-care at its core is necessary to healing trauma. It's literally caring after something. If you care after a flesh wound, then you're going to bandage it, presumably. You're going to use different treatments on it, like ointments or different things the doctor can prescribe to you, right? So self-care, when it comes to your emotional and mental wounds, is a process of caring for wounds that are there rather than trying to patch over them with good aesthetics. True deep self-care starts with healing trauma. The Body Keeps the Score has this passage at the beginning that rails off into different discoveries the scientific community has made with regards to that. I hope that you find information and inspiration from it. We can now develop methods and experiences that utilize the brain's own natural neuroplasticity to help survivors feel fully alive in the present and move on with their lives. There are fundamentally three avenues. One, top down by talking, reconnecting with others and allowing ourselves to know and understand what is going on with us while processing the memories of the trauma. Two, by taking medicines that shut down inappropriate alarm reactions or by utilizing other technologies that change the way the brain organizes information and three, bottom up, by allowing the body to have experiences that deeply and viscerally contradict the helplessness, rage, or collapse that results from trauma. Which one of these is best for any particular survivor is an empirical question. Most people I have worked with require a combination. Lastly, I want to say that there's an effort to make trauma apolitical, and even though I'm not delving any further into politics, I want you to know that that's not true. That's, that's wrong. Trauma does reveal a lot about politics because it deals with politics. Politics affects the health of you and your family. It affects the health of the community around you. And that lack of health, that lack of resources leads to people hurting other people. 
Watching a video like this might be helpful because there are shared experiences that can be made possible when you participate in some level of representation, when you consume content. There are great things that have happened to me from consuming content, but in order for those things to have a great impact on me, I had to take them and deal with them outside of consuming the content. I had to have moments alone with them. I had to have conversations about them. I had to connect with people in my lives about them. And so I hope whenever you watch a video of mine or by other amazing YouTubers like FD Signifier and Jesse Gender and St. Andrewism that you can heal and do things. You know what I mean? Anyway, um, <laughs> I did a video a few months ago called How I Burned Out in My 20s. That's a new title that I put on it because I want the algorithm to pick it up. Um, but it's a video where I talk about capitalism and how it has affected me. And I talk about particularly the idea of excess positivity and forcing oneself to be positive at all times, positive. So if you're interested in dealing with subjects of burnout and subjects of excess positivity, check that out. Thanks for watching. Hit like, comment, subscribe, hit the bell, send me a coffee. It's really an honor to be able to sit here and talk to you. Leave a comment if you have thoughts, if there's some suggestions you wanna make. And uh, next week, we're gonna be a little bit more lighthearted, okay? At least a little bit more. I can't promise we're gonna be super lighthearted, but we gotta get at least a little bit more lighthearted because I can't I can't do this every week. Oh my goodness, this, this oh my God, this video. Uh, let's end it. Bye. <laughs> Have a good night. Or day. Yeah.